carry on with, uh, we're still in uh, Norway, but uh, we're with uh, a plant which uh, is probably, or a, a, um, a genus, which is uh, probably the most used uh, um, vegetable, wild vegetable around the world, and it's nettle, or nestle. I think uh, probably most people here have uh, eaten nettle soup in the springtime, or something similar. Mm -hmm. um, it's a very popular, the most popular Norwegian vegetable. Um, you can think actually when, if, when you're eating your nettle soup in the springtime, um, you should be aware that you're part of a global movement of nettle eaters. Because practically everywhere in the world has its own local nettle species. So wherever, wherever you are in Asia, in North America, even in, in some African, um, in the Central Africa, there's a species called Urtica Maasai. Okay. Um, and in all cultures, people have used to uh, use nettles for food. Um, I'm not going to talk uh, for a long time about uh, you know the good properties of nettles, etc. You can uh, read about this in the book and in other other places. Um, but I'll just show you uh, um, a few <coughs> pictures of uh, different types of nettle. This is uh, this is me. Mm. <laughs> trying to impress people, actually, but actually it's uh, a um, stingless stinging nettle, as friend is um, Because there are varieties uh, or subspecies of uh, our own stinging nettle, the Brand Nestle, which uh, lack the stinging hairs. So if you don't, and everybody should have nettles in their garden, I think. <laughs> everybody. I mean, it's really one of, one of the best vegetables in the springtime, and it's also a fantastic plant for insects and particularly uh, some uh, particularly butterfly larvae, um, a very useful plant. And uh, if you don't like that, if you don't like the stings, then you can maybe plant one of these uh, stingless varieties becoming available now. This is from a market in, uh, in Italy, in Venice, in springtime. In many parts of the world they sell nettles as a vegetable on the markets. Um, this is Urtica cannabina from, uh, from Siberia in the botanical gardens in Oslo. Um, and uh, this one to the left here, death nettle. <laughs> Urtica ferops, ferocious nettle, which uh, comes from New Zealand. Um, actually can be eaten, but you really take a big risk. <laughs> um, no, it's not that serious, but uh, people have been known to die when they're out in the bush a long way from help and they fall into a... Um, these can be two, three metres tall. And you can see the, they've got serious stingers on them. Um, I didn't dare. Luckily it hasn't survived in my garden. It's not very hardy. But it was fun to grow it one year. And there are many recipes and ways to use, use nettles. This is a, an Italian recipe that actually could have, could have uh, come from Norway because we have most of the raw ingredients here. It's actually a potato pasta, okay? With uh, the sauce made of, made of nettles. Nestle ganache, nettle ganache. Of course, we have to include uh, dandelions, and dandelions are really probably one of the most important plants in the world these days. And the reason for that, there are many reasons. Um, Apart from the fact you can actually make a, a whole dinner with dandelion. You can use the roots as a root vegetable. You can use the young shoots, the young uh, leaves as a vegetable. There are five or six different vegetables from, from dandelions. <coughs> you can use the flowers in, uh, in salads. You can uh, use the flower buds to make uh, capers. You can make coffee from the roots. You can make wine from the flowers. So, yeah, you've got everything from the one plant, and we curse it. Why do we curse it? It's a fantastic plant, and it also looks beautiful. Don't you think? Actually, if you think of it in a different way, it's actually a beautiful plant, and it's highly successful. Um, and, in fact, the, I mean, there are thousands of uh, dandelion species in the world. It's the pink-leaved, pink-flowered dandelion from Siberia, which I've found growing as an ornamental in uh, gardens in the far north of Norway. There's uh, white flowered, various white flowered species, including this, the, the one from Svalbard, Svalbard dandelion, 
which is white, grows just outside of Long Yabu, um, totally edible, and there's this lovely red-leaved dandelion, Taraxacum rubifolium, which is, has leaves which are really nice in mixed salads in the springtime for a bit of colour, and probably extra healthy too. Um, but one of the main reasons that it, I say it's one of the most important plants in the world today is because uh, last autumn um, they finally made a car tire with dandelion rubber. <laughs> From the rubber dandelion, which looks very similar to, it has yellow flowers, it's very difficult to separate from the, um, from the common dandelion we see. It's a species that comes from West Asia. All dandelions contain, can be used to produce rubber. Uh, but this one has extra uh, good quality. And uh, actually 15 years ago, I was the sole supplier of seed of this particular species of dandelion. Um, but it turned out that uh, around about 15 years ago, various uh, uh, researchers around the world working on rubber um, uh, were given the job to, to look at alternatives to the natural rubber trees in, from the tropics because there is a, a, a fungal disease which is uh, seriously impacting some of the populations. And because they're all clones, there's no genetic variability, one tree gets it, they all get it. So they were looking for alternatives to, uh, to the rubber trees to produce, uh, uh, to produce rubber and preferably, for example, in the US. Okay? Rubber is extremely important, you know, and, and is equally important as, uh, as uh, oil almost. Um, and uh, the plant, it turns out, is the, is the best alternative to the rubber trees is, is dandelion. During the last World War, there was actually quite a lot of dandelion rubber production, both in Russia and, and the US. At that time, it was also difficult to get rubber from, from the tropics. So, Taraxa gum is on its way. So soon you can cycle home from your dandelion party <laughs> as well. <laughs> and here's me in Japan, seeing for the first time the white flowered <laughs> See the joy on that guy's face. Um, often uh, sold on markets, this is from southern France, um, blanched either in the field by putting soil over the young plants or in darkened houses to make for a slightly less bitter experience. Um, this is in my garden. This is actually a, a French cultivar a French variety of dandelion, which looks very similar to our, uh, our um, weed dandelion that we have, um, but it has more upright leaves and very dense, so quite high, high production. So this has uh, um, been blanched in my garden using, using just having a pot over it in the, in the very early spring. And they look beautiful when they're blanched. Another thing, yeah, we have a Facebook group, of course, Friends of Taraxicum, so please join us. Lots of interesting stuff going on there. Um, and uh, I learned on an American foraging forum uh, just uh, a few years ago that uh, actually the dandelion flower stalks were actually very tasty. I always thought they would be very bitter to taste. But if you take them just before the flowers start appearing, the buds, when they're still in bud, and you just cook them very quickly and add some butter, you get what I call Lerva noodle or dandy noodles. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was surprisingly not bitter. So please, please try it. Um, but people are very different in their, their sensitivity to, to bitter. So you, know, you have tasters and non-tasters. Um, and the other real gourmet um, product from the dandelion is the Lerva Skok, or the dandy choke, like artichoke, but uh, in a similar way to the artichoke, it's the under the flower. Okay? When the flowers start appearing in the early spring, you see them appearing right at ground level. You know, if at that time you dig down to the root, there's about this distance which, of leaf, which is, uh, which is uh, um, not exposed to the sunlight. So this white bit you see here is delicious. 
and plants naturally by the, by the growth method of the plant. And dandelion temp tempura from Japan. And then we have uh, lerp sticker, or um, lubbage in English. Um, very popular, very hardy plant that many people have in their gardens. Um, we tend to use it in Norway as a soup ingredient. Um, ingredients, but you don't need much of it, do you? It's very, very strong tasting. But if again you blanch it in the springtime, it becomes much milder and it becomes like a slightly strong celery. So I call it a spring celery. And it's perennial, very hardy as I say, and it comes back year after year after year. So, so and as you can see, in the springtime, there's absolutely no damage from insects or anything. If I try and grow celery in my garden, it's always heavily attacked by snails and slugs in the autumn. So much easier to grow organically. Yeah. Will you please share the vegetables? Yeah. What does that do to the nutritional value? Yeah, I had, I, I think uh, I've seen a few analysis of that. It, it doesn't make a huge difference, I don't, I don't think. But uh, do you know, Eva, have you seen any analysis of that? There aren't many analysis on it, but I don't think it's, I mean, it's not something, it looks as though I'm blanching everything here, but I, I don't. <laughs> no, know, it's, it's a mixture, yeah. yeah. But uh, just because it's something which isn't often thought of. Yeah. It's more, it changes the, changes the, uh, changes the taste. The taste yeah. But I don't really worry about uh, nutrition and that kind of no. thing personally because no. I have a wide range of different vegetables and uh, I think I probably get all my, well I feel anyway, yeah. I get my, <laughs> my needs. Yeah. But it's kind of milder, you can eat more of it, but yeah. you might not have to eat more. Yeah, yeah, perhaps. Yeah. Exactly. If that's your main focus, then maybe you shouldn't blanch, but uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I also use uh, perennials to, to make, to do to make seed sprouts in the springtime. So these here are planted in earth in the autumn in a bucket. They've left outside because they will only germinate if, it's, if they've gone through this cold period. Stratification as it's called, technically. I bring it into the house in the early spring. They start germinating and I just use them as a, as a spring vegetable in, in salads and things. So you can do that. There are many different possibilities. Um, I think uh, I'm kind of running out of time here, aren't we? What's the time now? Spring through. Okay, we'll take uh, this last one from Norway because that's particularly of interest to you. Carver or <coughs> caraway is uh, probably the, the most used uh, wild plant in Norway. It's used as a, mainly as a, as a, in the past, mainly used as a, as a, as a herb, as a spice, um, well known for being used in aquavit, of course, and in various cheeses and uh, suricol, sauerkraut. Um, but uh, you can also use, there are, is a tradition in Norway, an old tradition, to make what's called carvacol super. Has anybody here eaten caraway soup? Yeah, a few of you. And you take the, the young shoots of the caraway plant in the springtime. And uh, this is a um, using caraway to make a soup. You find this uh, tradition throughout its uh, geographical, wild geographical range, which is from Norway to the Himalayas. So it's a wild plant over that whole area. So you find that people make soup from the young, or use the young leaves in different ways in the springtime throughout this range. Um, apart from that, um, we also, it's also a root vegetable, um, which not many people are aware of. And uh, um, this was discovered actually in the, the mid 19th century by uh, Professor Schubler, who works as a botanical botanist at the Botanical Gardens in Oslo. Uh, and he's well known for setting up research stations to trial new novel vegetables and ornamentals in different parts of Norway. So we had research stations in, in Finnmark in southern Norway, all over the place. And he also travelled quite extensively, uh, also in Europe. And on one journey to Austria, he discovered that above the tree line in Austria, they were actually using caraway as a root vegetable, like we would grow carrots or parsnip, pastinac, hubert. They were using, they had selected um, 
caraway for large fruits and the roots themselves if you've had caraway soup you'll know are uh, quite sweet tasting, quite pleasant tasting actually and uh, when he came back to Oslo from that trip he was inspired by this and uh, he asked his research stations all over the country to send him seed and he started to try and select so he grew them and tried to select for larger and larger roots and he wrote after some years that uh, he'd managed to produce a caraway root with as large roots as uh, um, what's it called? Hamburg parsley, a civet root. You know this? It's a quite, quite a good size. <coughs> so it's just a picture. I'm, uh, I'm doing the same thing. Um, the North Norwegian Genetic Resource Centre have also collected caraway from all over the country to look for better varieties for aquavit production. So I got seed from all these different ones and, and are playing around trying to select for, for larger roots because I think this is a, a root vegetable that we need. Um, I can't grow, I can't be self-sufficient in, car in carrots root in my garden because uh, the seed doesn't mature. So I have to bring in new seed every year. I like to save my own seed. But caraway is totally hardy, it grows all over the country and very easy to take seed off. So I think we need it. Distribution <coughs> caraway throughout Norway. A very large distribution. Okay, we're past that. Uh, a little bit about a project I'm working on. Uh, um, we're looking for, for tips from, uh, from the public for old Norwegian perennial vegetables. So these are and herbs. Herbs are <coughs> Norwegian vegetables that are over 50 years old. So if you know, if you've got a, a grandmother or something who's uh, been growing a, a particular herb or, or, or vegetable for for that long time, we're interested to hear from you. Okay. Um, there's a list there of the different ones in Norwegian that uh, could be of interest. Asparagus, different types of onion, schools on the rules, lurks in here, salt henry, etc. So contact me if, you're, if you have any information. Okay. <coughs> Western uh, Central Europe. Um, one of my favourites and my oldest perennial vegetable is. Uh, is strand de or um, sea kale, cranberry maritima, which is uh, um, in, related to kale, but a completely different uh, family. It um, uh, grows along the coastlines of Europe, um, or including Norway, up to as far north as uh, Trindelag. There's one lo location in Trindelag, but most mostly along Sørlandet and. Uh, Kind of the south of Norway to the to the Swedish border. Um, also widespread right the way down into the Mediterranean in the Black Sea. Um, it grows on coast there too. So this is a plant which uh, tolerates uh, quite high salt conditions. So another another possibility to grow commercially on salt land, and that's certainly been been doing now. In uh, they're, they're growing sea kale commercially in, in the Netherlands on salty land. Um, and in the uh, 19th century, this really, and I, I think of sea kale as kind of like the king of vegetables. Real, uh, it's the royalty of, of, of the vegetable kingdom. Partly because it was used by royalty and favourite of the royalty, um, but uh, also um, in, 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 in the UK in the, in the 19th century, um, it was, uh, well, it, traditionally it was harvested from the beaches by people. And they discovered that. Uh, because it grows on, uh, on very exposed beaches, kind of sandy beaches and rocky beaches, which are exposed to wave activity in the winter. So during the winter, often these plants will be covered with seaweed or with, with uh, sand or whatever, and the young shoots that grow up through that, that uh, sand or seaweed were, were naturally blanched. They were white and they were much tastier because the green sea kale is quite strong tasting. And this is probably where the um, where blanching of vegetables originated. People observed in nature that uh, um, the young shoots were much tastier. And therefore they started themselves deliberately going down to the beaches and putting seaweed or, 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 or sand over the plants and then coming back a month later and, and harvesting the product. Um, but eventually 
It became so popular also in the cities. It was picked in such a such large amounts that it was uh, uh, began to disappear. And in in the 1890s, it was actually um, was actually uh, protected in the UK. Um, so it was forbidden to, to, to take from nature. So I, I would encourage you to grow it in your gardens rather than uh, collecting it from the beaches in southern Norway. Um, it's uh, relatively easy to grow. As I said, my oldest plant is actually 30 years old, or more than that, 35 actually. And uh, it still produces every springtime, so it could be. And it's also a beautiful plant when it's in flower. Mm -hmm. You can uh, use the flowers. Um, this is a traditional forcing pot for planting in a garden, but it's only the rich people that could afford these, of course. The poor people would uh, use labour and put earth, or heap earth over the plants. In fact, the poor people reckon that the product under these things was not good. It was not as good as uh, doing it by hand because it was very hot under these in the sun. So the, yeah, so they changed the taste apparently. Can you uh, grow it inland, away from the coastline? Yeah, you, yeah, well I grow it in my garden in, in, in Trondheim. Yeah, but you are close to the floor. Yeah, I'm quite close to the side, so relatively mild, but uh, areas which have good snow cover, it's worth trying. Um, in my garden, it's, uh, I have lost plants in the past that haven't been, so I, I actually cover with, uh, with leaves or, or something to give it an extra protection. In the but that's more important than the salt? Hmm? Oh, you yeah. don't need yeah. salt. Oh, it doesn't need salt. No, definitely not. No, it doesn't need that. But I use seaweed, as you can see here. This is seaweed mulch mm -hmm. around the plants, which I collect from right below, right there, below my house. So I've only ever only used seaweed as fertilizer in my garden for 30 years. So I've not used animal manure or anything <coughs> like that. It seems to work. Good stuff. Mm. Good. Excellent. And the broccolis are also delicious and actually much milder tasting, so they don't, don't need any blanching or anything. But then you don't get the flowers. This is from Lindesness, from a, a tour I did. Beautiful plants. Um, some years ago, now we're on uh, southern England. Um, this is, these are the chalk cliffs in Dorset, the so-called Jurassic coastline. This place here at the top left is uh, Durdle Door, it's called. This is a place that, uh, where I spent my holidays with my family in a tent when I was a, when I was a young lad. Um, and uh, in connection with my mum's 80th birthday some years ago, uh, the whole family gathered at this place again. And to my big surprise, the cliff tops were a pure vegetable garden. <laughs> uh, there was, uh, this is wild beetroot, strong vetter. Um, which is the, the which is the ancestor of all the beetroot vegetables. So you have uh, um, you have beetroot, you have um, Swiss chard, um, mongold, um, you have sugar beet, of course, which is hugely important. They all stem originally from this wild plant, and they're still using the genes within the wild plant, for example, to breed resistance against the fungal attack in the, in the uh, in these vegetables, and it's actually a perennial. So the wild plant that all these vegetables stem from is, is perennial. So there's now interest within permaculture and people interested in perennial vegetables in growing them as, as leafy vegetables, as perennials, which is interesting. Right beside it was this plant here, which is a, a wild <coughs> kale, pool, um, growing pool. Um, in seed, this is the seed, seed head here. And uh, these are perennial kales as well, as I mentioned earlier. And this is wild carrot growing beside them. That was amazing. Uh, as I say, kales and the huge variety of different uh, conventional cabbages and kales and broccolis that we have today, they're all derived originally from from uh, perennial plants, and that perenniality has kind of disappeared. So if we grow the conventional vegetables, most of them today, they, they die after flowering in the second year. But luckily, thanks to uh, home gardeners, in, in just a few home gardeners in Europe and North America, 
um, some of these old perennial kales, which were much more common 100 years ago, um, have survived because they are very valuable vegetables. So, for example, we have Dorbenton's kale, which is from, fr from France, which is a low-growing kale, and these could all be very old, and they're mostly propagated by cuttings rather than from seed. So you just break off a side shoot and give it to your neighbor. So it's very easy to do. So we don't need any international seed corporations to uh, sell us seed. We can actually just pass over our cabbages to, to neighbor. Um, there's also an ornamental variant of uh, Dorbentons. And uh, it's, as I say, it's low growing. And it's sometimes the, 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 um, the stalks, they fall over and they root in the ground. And in that way, they, they can spread to make quite a big clump over many years. Behind it is a uh, tree collard, um, tree called, um, which uh, bears quite a few members of uh, our Norwegian seed savers. Seed savers are now growing, thanks to Andrew McMillian, who's here somewhere, I think. No, still in the meeting, I think, yeah. <laughs> um, and this one is actually from North America. Um, and I've seen pictures of them in California, up to three meters tall. And they can be very old. And we think that possibly they originate um, with the, the slave trade from Africa. Because the only place in the world which still grows commercial perennial kales is Kenya. Sukuma Wiki is the name. From Belgium, a few gardens in one small part of Belgium have uh, preserved this old Erdiger called Erdiger Moss in Belgium. And one garden in the UK has uh, grown Taunton Dean's cottages kale right up to the modern day. Um, and uh, now, thanks to the increased interest and realization that the plant genetic resources in these vegetables are very important for, at least for breeding purposes, and we think also for, um, in, in, a, in, in the situation where we find ourselves with climate change, etc that uh, particularly perennials, that, that these have survived is uh, quite remarkable actually. Uh, but uh, they're now safe and now grown by quite a few people within Europe and, and Norway. But they're not 100% hardy. You can't grow them everywhere in Norway. Um, but you can take cuttings in the autumn and overwinter indoors and then plant again in the spring if you're in such a climate. That's what I do in Trundelag. Um, I visited this uh, English Taunton Dean's cottage tail. Um, this was the picture I took about five years ago. I came back to this place uh, last summer, and uh, this is what it looked like. Huge, big stem, and you know, you see this guy here? You see how big it is. Um, the pigeons do, and they, they were eating the tops of it. So. Otherwise, it could have grown even bigger. <laughs> so they're quite impressive plants. Yeah, we, this is an old uh, Norwegian ornamental plant, which you find uh, can be a bit invasive in gardens. Um, but you see it particularly in, in old gardens, um, which is also a vegetable, which has an interesting story from the UK, um, because, uh, whoops, in the UK, they have a, a tradition, a very old tradition, to make something they call Easter Ledge Pudding, or Dock Pudding. Dock is like, um, um, like Hoi Molle, you know, Rumex family, um, Sorrel, things like that. And uh, it's actually a, a, a vegetable, um, a vegetable patty, Grunsox Carbonada, made from whole barley, and the whole barley was cooked together with a whole range of different vegetables, wild and, and uh, cultivated. So you have rhubarb, for example. Some people use rhubarb in this, uh, in this vegetable. This is, this is uh, ladies' mantle, Mari Kofta. Here we have, uh, but it had to have ormerot or bistort in as an ingredient. It's nettles, this is uh, sorrel, and this is <coughs> blanched. Uh, Dandelion. And uh, in this, uh, in the in 1973, 
in this very small village in Yorkshire, in Northern England, in Mithorn Royd. Um, they decided that they would, uh, they, they saw that this traditional dish was in the process of disappearing. So they decided, a few people decided that they would announce the World Dock Pudding Championships. <laughs> <laughs> they were the only people that could do it in this village, you know. <laughs> At least they thought so, because I'm trained. I'm going to take part. <laughs> But uh, each house had its own recipe and used different herbs and you know, sleep. And they even announced this uh, competition in the Times of London, which was in 1973. And thanks to that uh, competition, it's now a dish that has uh, been preserved and uh, that competition is still being uh, arranged every year. Now, I'm going to pass to Ramslerk. We all know about that. Ramsons. Time is going. North American ramps, which is a very similar species, which is also in the process of being uh, um, eliminated from nature because of over harvesting, unfortunately. And then we come to horseradish, which I've mentioned earlier, heterot. Um, I always, always harvest uh, roots, you know, I use the roots. You always have too much radish it grows and spreads so I dig up the roots and I, I store them indoors in my cold cellar and then as we approach the springtime I plant them up and they start sprouting in the dark they produce these uh, blanched very tasty spring shoots which are no doubt highly nutritious and a bit later on the flowers appear and uh, they're also fantastic to look at and also to have in mixed salads. They're quite strong tasting, but in when you mix things, that also is a, a form of dilution, so you don't uh, uh, experience the, the bitterness so much, etc. So when you, nobody ever made a dandelion salad on its own. It was always made mixed with other things or mixed with oils and vinegars and things to disguise the bitterness. So don't bother trying to just to eat it raw. If you think it's too bitter, try it in a mixed salad. It dilutes the taste. Yeah. Um, question? Yeah. Uh, when you take in a root for the winter, mm. do you take how much soil do you kind of bring um, I, I usually s uh, store it in damp leaves. Uh -huh. We've got plenty of leaves so in the garden. you don't take that much of the soil? No. No, I dig up the root as uh -huh. it is. And shake uh, it off. Then. Shake it off and just, uh, yeah. Or, or you could just plant it in a, in a big pot and put the pot in the cellar and then just bring the pot into a cold room in the late spring and or even in the middle of winter and it will start sprouting. And you could do that with a whole range of different uh, green or vegetables to extend the season. Yeah, just to mention, we've really got time, we're running out here, what's the time now? 44, 20 minutes now, I haven't really got time. Also, pure leek, was also derived from a perennial plant. And the wild species it's derived from, still there are still um, varieties of wild leek which are grown in, on a small scale locally, all the way from uh, the UK to Afghanistan. So, um, but our, our present day Pure or leek. Um, sometimes it does, after, if you grow it on the second season, it flowers. Sometimes you'll see it start multiplying. There'll be side shoots forming, and that's a kind of a throwback to the original perenniality of that, uh, that plant. I'll go past that. Okay, we've come to the Mediterranean countries, and that's uh, an area that was hugely ins inspirational for me. Um, we've all heard of the um, the um, Mediterranean diet. Some years ago they discovered that uh, old folks living in the, in the mountain villages in the, in the Mediterranean countries, they had very low levels of uh, heart and, and lung disease, etc. And uh, plant scientists or ethnobotanists, they, they got the job to try and find out what the hell these people have been eating all these years. And actually just in the course of the last 20 years they've discovered um, over 3,000 different plant species used by the Mediterranean peoples uh, traditionally. Huge diversity. 
And not only that, they also discovered that they, um, they, there, are, there are many examples of multi-species dishes. So dishes made with, for example, over 50 different wild and cultivated <coughs> herbs in the springtime. Everything from salads to, to pizzas to soups. Um, and this was kind of like a, a spring ritual. You know, the spring had come and uh, they needed a boost to vitamins and, and stuff. So they went out and they made these, uh, these special dishes. And that's, uh, and the mixed salad is, is an example of that. And uh, this gave the inspiration then for, for these uh, multi-species salads that I started, started making, just a few examples through the years. And my own diet, Barstow's diet, 80 a day keeps the doctor away. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we've also, yeah, because we can do it. We made a pesto with 230 different types of onion, and we made a ferment with uh, it's the world record ferment with 412 different plants. It can ferment anything. It's really tasty yeah. and fun to make. <laughs> that was with uh, Rita Amundsen, if you know her, in Oslo, who's the Norwegian fermentation queen, I think. Yeah. And uh, I also made this uh, calzoni. You know what calzone is nowadays, you see it sold in particularly in Oslo everywhere. Um, I would uh, put in box pizza. And uh, this was a recipe I found in, uh, in Sicilia with over 50 different species. And uh, this here took me six years to make because first I had to grow these, uh, <laughs> these 50 species so they all were available at the same time. Um, and it took a couple of hours to put together, and uh, yeah, <laughs> crazy, yeah. Um, Mediterranean, another family which is extremely important, wild collected, is Scorzonera. Uh, we know Svartrold Scorzonera is an old uh, vegetable here in Norway, which uh, has had a bit of a renaissance in recent years. Has anybody seen it in supermarkets here? No, I've seen it in Sweden. You have? No, I've tried to grow it. Wouldn't grow. Okay. So the seed didn't germinate or little small seeds of the Okay, okay. Okay. Try again. It's relatively easy. My this uh, this plant here, but it's mainly used for the for the root, you know. Um, and uh, my oldest uh, school of error is actually you know, thirty five years old and I got it as a plant originally. So these could be really it could be older than you. Um, but nowadays they're mainly grown as annuals for the very long, thin roots. Um, but Scorzonera is much more than that. It's actually a, a spring um, lettuce substitute. So you can use the young leaves as the base of a salad. Um, very mild tasting, like, uh, like lettuces. And uh, later on in the season you can use the, the flower stems, which are actually very sweet tasting surprisingly sweet. You can use the flower buds in, for example, stir-fry dishes, and then you can use the flowers in, uh, in, in salads. And you can continue doing this for, the, for your whole life if you want to, because those plants just come back again and again. The roots, after a couple of years, get a bit too coarse, so forget about them. Just grow them as a, as a vegetable. different species of uh, Scorzonera and Tragopogon, which is Yatesheg, and uh, uh, what's it called, um, Parva Root, that's another one, but they're biennial. Yeah, we've talked about artichokes, so we'll hop over that, hop over these. Hops is a fantastic spring vegetable that very few Norwegians eat, but uh, very popular in Italy, here on the market in, in Venezia. Venice in the springtime, huge bundles of hop shoots used as a vegetable. Um, and don't worry, you guys, you can still make your beer because uh, <laughs> take all the shoots and they'll come back and still produce your, your hops. You stir fried? Stir fried, yeah. A salad, whatever, yeah. It's in the book. And uh, there's another tradition from Belgium which, uh, which uh, produces a huge amount of hops for the beer industry. 
uh, traditionally the, the workers uh, were uh, the hop uh, hop uh, vines were often uh, what do you call it uh, they were they were cut you know and, and pruned um, for shart and the workers got to take the top shoots home as a vegetable and uh, they also have a, a tradition called Jack du Houdon, where they produce blanched hop shoots, which is a delicacy in, uh, in, in Belgium. You can see them here. The very thin shoots here are hops, and these are asparagus, the very thin ones. Yeah, I could talk a long time about Sponsk Cherubel or um, Sweet Sicily. So we won't today. I think most of you know that one. In the Mediterranean countries, there, um, the recipes are generally quite simple. Um, they go out and they pick the, the vegetables. They're, they're cooked very quickly in, in water. And the cooking process often has to do with some of the herbs that they mix in are toxic when they're raw, <gasps> but detoxic, detoxicated when they're, um, when they're cooked. Plants like uh, clematis, clematis vitalba, tusk clematis, German uh, you know, old man's beard in English, is one of the most commonly wild foraged vegetables in, in Italy, despite the fact it's actually um, slightly poisonous raw. But it's cooked, and the cooking de detoxifies. So they basically cook them up, and then they stir fry them in uh, olive oil, Add a little bit of garlic and um, often chili these days, and then they just mix it with uh, scrambled egg, egg and rare. And uh, if you want a gourmet version of that, you just add a few flowers. <laughs> yeah, we'll get past that. Asparagus we've talked about. Got to get finished. Chicory huge variety of vegetable chicories. I grow a lot of them nowadays more rather than kales because they're much, or cabbage family, because they're much easier to grow. There are very few um, insects and uh, other things that attack the chicory family. And chicories are also derived from wild perennial plants. And they're rather beautiful in, in flower as well. Just a few pictures of different uh, chicories. They're chicories for, for making coffee alternative and chicories as root vegetables, ones for sprouting in the cellar in the winter, eulisomot, I think you call it, or shikons, perennial, perennial, yeah, we'll go past these ones, We're running a bit out of time, we'll get to the Caucasus, so a few words about uh, this area, one of my favourite perennial vegetables is this one here, Pavlitsia tamnoides or Stjarnamenda Caucasian spinach, and I have some seed of this one as well, which I usually have with me in my talks. Um, this is a, a plant which, uh, as I say, originates in the Caucasus. It came to Scandinavia in the, in the 1870s and uh, was originally grown as, a, as a, an ornamental plant. It's a climber, which can climb to three to four metres during the summer and uh, was uh, used originally as an ornamental. It was popular from about 1870 to 1920, after which there were new, better climbers, I guess, that came in and, uh, and replaced it. But in the meantime, some people uh, had started uh, eating the young shoots. It's uh, related, it's in the same family as, uh, as um, fat hen, or um, uh, what do you call it, melderstock is an annual weed, which is delicious as well. Um, so, um, kind of related to the spinaches and, and, that, and that tribe. Um, so some people have learned that, that this was actually quite tasty, and um, some of the old plants in old gardens from the 1920s have actually survived right up to the modern day. Um, so these could be really old plants. I had a project for the Norwegian for the Nordic Gene Bank a few years ago, where we collected uh, uh, seeds from, uh, it was about five or six different places in Finland, um, two or three in, in Sweden, and one place in Norway, at uh, 
Fossil uh, Prestigore has had some vicarage in Vesterolen, up near the Lofoten Islands, um, where one plant has survived right up to, to modern day. And there now the seeds of those are now preserved in the uh, Nordic gene bank, and probably some of them are up in Svalbard at the uh, uh, preservation. Because this vegetable really is uh, probably the most uh, Scandinavian of all vegetables, because actually it was unknown as a vegetable outside of Scandinavia until about 10 years ago when I wrote about it in, uh, in uh, Permaculture magazine. Um, so it was totally missing from all these, uh, well, I call it herb 2 doesn't mention it, Plants for a Future doesn't mention it. So it was a clo closely kept secret in Scandinavia. And it's an incredible plant. It's uh, my oldest plant, which is 15 years old. It produces about 250 shoots in the very early spring. So unlike hosta, for example, which starts appearing in, in May, this one actually has young shoots already, which actually appear in the autumn and stand over the whole winter, totally unaffected by temperatures down in, actually down to minus 30 in Finland. And uh, then during March, they start extending and you can start harvesting towards the end of March, even in a place like, like Trindelag. Uh, they're mild tasting. Um, they can be used raw and they can be used, be used as a spinach plant. And uh, today, probably, um, there are now thousands of people growing this around the world. Not a huge number, but uh, thousands, thanks to the social media. This is one of the few vegetables is actually, or the first vegetable that really has gone um, gone a bit ballistic through, uh, through uh, being spread over, um, over Facebook and Twitter and etc. You, you eat the leaves too, right? You eat the very young shoots um, that you can use the leaves later in the season. Mm -hmm. actually, you can use them cooked in, to make a spinach pie or, or something. Here's the spinach pie from the older leaves. It's what it looks like, in, it climbs up into trees in nature, so it's a, a very good, doesn't need any sunlight either. Um, although it does grow a, a bit better if you give it some, some sun. But some, certainly. We have our own Facebook group, Friends of Hablitzia, <laughs> where the center of distribution of Hablitzia has happened, I guess. <laughs> Um, also from the Caucasus, we have uh, uh, this relation of, uh, of sea kale, buskstrunkel, or um, heartleaf cranby, it's called in English, um, which you see occasionally in old gardens in, in Norway. Very, very hardy plant, much hardier than the sea kale that we grow that comes from the beaches. Um, and it's also more productive than, uh, than sea kale. Again, a bit too strong to eat without blanching, so it's best to blanch it. Again, all these are very large buckets over it, and there you go. And this, this actual plant here produces this much food on about this much soil in my garden. It's quite incredible. Yeah? Um, doesn't light affect the growth? No, because the, the energy is in the roots. I mean, obviously, it, it's only... Um, it's only once you've harvested, it will start growing again, and then it's in the sunlight, and it will continue growing. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't take all the all the leaves. Yeah, just leave some to grow on, and they turn green eventually. And uh, yeah, you can also use the broccolis. Are very tasty too. Final leg Himalaya, another fascinating allium, um, which I call Sherpa onion, or Nepal, Nepal onion, which grows in very high in the Himalayas and uh, is a favourite of the Sherpa people that we know most from climbing Everest, etc. Um, they had a home life and this is one of the wild plants that they domesticated in their gardens and grow up there. And uh, they're actually, um, they, they also grow on the, and collect from the nature in a, in a large scale and they're both dried and, and transported down to the markets in, in the lower lands, Nepal. A beautiful onion, very special onion in that uh, it actually has uh, 
uh, it actually um, uh, spreads by rhizomes under the under the surface. So it has roots. And it can appear suddenly, 30 centimeters or so from the from the mother plant. And those rhizomes are also edible. Um, there are a number of. Uh, it is sometimes grown in Norway as a ornamental. There are a number of different ornamental forms, which are beautiful flowers in the, in, in, in the autumn. And um, it's also special in the fact that it's, uh, I al always think every spring that it's dead, because it doesn't start shooting until the end of May, very, very late. And uh, I think this is probably uh, that it's still remembering the monsoon rains in the Himalayas, which start in June. So it's kind of triggered to grow at that particular time of year when the moisture appears, I guess. Anyway, um, and then last autumn, I, um, yeah, you harvest them at that stage. <coughs> and last autumn, I, I was put, uh, it turned out that there was a, a, a botanist from Nepal working in Trondheim. Uh, and uh, he contacted me, he heard about my garden and uh, asked if he could come and visit. And he brought his wife along. and. Uh, here they are in my garden and they were wandering around and there were so many plants that they were finding that they knew from the, the homeland, including this Nepal. So they're meeting their, this, actually this Nepalian onion for the first time. They've never seen it live before because they live in the lowlands. They've eaten it, they eat it a lot, but only from the markets because it grows very high up and, and Kathmandu, near where they live, is quite low down. Um, so that was quite fascinating. They were so happy to see, finally had to come all the way to Tr to Trungelag to, <laughs> to find what they call Jibu for the first time. <laughs> anyway, and uh, yeah, they, uh, yeah, they were so inspired by all, all, all these plants that they knew they, they invited themselves to my house to make a Napoleon feast, which we did in the autumn, which is fantastic. <laughs> So I could go out into my garden one day and I can forage from North America. The next day I can forage from the Himalayas and I can do, so I can forage any, anywhere in the world. I never know when I go out into my garden what I'm going to pick. It's always a surprise. Siberia, we're almost finished now. Two more onions from Siberia. Ali Newtons and Senescens are cultivated, beautiful onions as well in Siberia, Siberian gar home gardens. And there's one curiosity which is uh, called Norland's onion, which is now being distributed through, uh, again, the, the Norwegian Seed Saver organization. Um, this was an onion which was found in, in gardens in northern Sweden, in Norland, um, being grown as an as a ornamental. Um, and it never produces seed. It turns out to be a hybrid between two botanical species. We don't know how, how it, how it uh, arrived there. It's not known from any, anywhere else in the world. Probably it just uh, uh, was two plants that crossed in some collector's garden and uh, spontaneously we have a, a very interesting, robust <coughs> vegetable. Very tasty and very productive. And, yeah, is there one more? We talked a little about lilies. All Lilliums are edible. So, tiger lily, tiger lilia, martagon lilia, which are common um, garden plants in Norway, grown as ornamentals, have edible uh, bulbs. I was in Singapore a few years ago and uh, um, they were selling lily bulbs, fresh lily bulbs, in the supermarket. So I bought them, took them home, and I thought, Put it up, I'll plant a few out in the garden and see what happens. Two years later, this is what happened. So this was from a supermarket in Singapore. Not grown in Singapore, probably grown in the mountains further north. Very, very hardy plants. I've had those for several years. And the bulbs could be used, uh, they use them just like we would use uh, onions or potatoes or uh, as a carbohydrate uh, source in the winter. And uh, they're very tasty. This particular one has very sweet tasting. Some of some lilliums have quite a, a bitter tasting um, bulbs, so don't bother with them. 
Last few pictures, just uh, showing some more edimentals or proof soccer from uh, the Far East. So your garden can, can look quite, quite nice and also provide you with food. And uh, I think just about finally, this is uh, Hundetan from my trip to Japan, which is a very important traditional vegetable there also. In Vorida Grown Sake, in my garden. A few words about, uh, there it's talked a bit about uh, Norwegian seed savers. Come along, we have uh, steering, no, not that no, you don't have to talk, just uh, come and show yourselves, you guys. This is the uh, steering committee of the Norwegian seed savers. Look at them. <laughs> <laughs> so please, please join us. We have uh, a website here, Norwegian Seed Savers for Leno. Um, just click in here if you want to want to join us on this exciting journey, the world of edible plants and uh, traditional Norwegian vegetables. Um, okay. And if you want to be uh, on the board, then please also yeah, send me. Yeah, you need some more, uh, <coughs> you know, we're looking Stuart, for, you know. yeah, board No, no, Intercepti, uh, Laura May Stuart, so. Where is he from? Fantastic. So, I think that's just about it. One more? Apart from me.